good. Managed to do that without making you disappear, or which I managed to do last time. So that's good. I can still see everyone. Uh, so we come to the second half of this um, very difficult passage, and it's difficult in many regards. It's not easy to understand some parts, and it certainly isn't easy uh, to preach. But um, I'm going to intend to do that. And may the Lord bless us as we do so. And I want us to go back, um, as it were, mentally to the night when Jesus was betrayed. We are coming up to Easter time, so it's kind of appropriate to do that anyway. But on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus told his disciples um, that he was going away to the Father. He said in John 13, uh, 33, my children... I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. And Peter got very troubled about this. I think they all did. <laughs> but Peter was the spokesperson oftentimes for, you know, putting into words what everybody in the group was thinking. And so um, he, we, we are recorded uh, a short conversation between Jesus and Peter. And Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Now he had told them where he was going and I think they suspected it. And then he makes it very clear that he is going to the father. Um, but I want us to focus on what Jesus said, because the word that he chose is very significant, where he said, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter will follow him to the father. Now, how did Jesus go to the father? He went through the cross. As Jesus went to the Father through the cross, so Peter will enter heaven through many hardships. And hardships in which Satan will desire for him to fall away from Jesus. Did not Jesus tell Peter, Satan has asked you to be sifted, but I have prayed for you. But there is that danger that lurks uh, upon upon. God's people, our adversary, Satan, desiring to devour us like a roaring lion. And these hardships are designed by God for our good. But as far as Satan is concerned, he is always going to be on the lookout to devour us through these things. And so um, following Jesus means going through hardships and through perseverance, through all those hardships, that's how we get to heaven. We won't fall, fall into it. <laughs> you know, that would be lovely, wouldn't it? You know, you, uh, you become a Christian, boom, instantly, uh, you are in glory. I mean, that would be just superb as far as I'm concerned, but that's not how the plan of salvation works. And therefore we need perseverance every day of our lives. And so did these dear brothers and sisters to whom the letter to the Hebrews was written. And um, he, uh, the, the writer is, is writing to them pastorally. And he desires their perseverance. But some of them have started drifting away from the faith. And have gone away from the Lord. And so there are some warning passages, uh, some of them which we've already encountered, and this probably is the hardest of them all. Maybe we could make the case that this warning passage that we have read is probably the hardest in the New Testament. And I would um, break it down to two. Well, actually, I, I don't, but I think the Holy Spirit did because it really has two parts. There is a warning. And then there is an encouragement. And so what we will do tonight, we'll first have a look at the warning. And then 
we look at the encouragement that God issues to his people. And the warning, I would probably start by saying like this, suppose there was a man, right? Suppose there was a man. And here is a description of this man. Suppose there was a man who is a Christian. Verses four and five in, uh, in Hebrews chapter six are filled with words in which the writer goes out of his way to say, these are Christians. And so these are the, um, the descriptions. Who once have been enlightened. Once have been enlightened, which refers to their conversion. Conversion happens at and is caused by the breaking in of God's light into the sin-darkened heart. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Paul talks about them coming to faith in Christ. And for him, it was quite literal, <laughs> a big light when he came to know the Lord, being enlightened. Secondly, we are told that they have tasted the heavenly gift. They have tasted the, the heavenly gift. We're still in verse four, which in this context most likely refers to eternal life. Eternal life, the Holy Spirit, um, salvation, Christ. I believe all are described in the New Testament with this phrase of being a gift. But in this context, probably it's the whole package of eternal life. It is the blessed knowledge of and fellowship with the living God. The complete package of salvation, if you like. And the word tasted, which we have here, uh, they have tasted the heavenly gift. That is used in 2.9, Hebrews 2.9, for Jesus tasting death. Now, I mentioned that because Jesus' tasting death was not a partial. He didn't kind of taste death. He died properly. It was a full taste, if you like, a full participation in death. And likewise here, it's a full participation of the heavenly gift that is in view. Thirdly, this person is described, or these people are described as those who have shared in the Holy Spirit, which is a vivid way of saying they have the Holy Spirit. Now, in the New Testament, the sign that someone is a Christian is precisely that. They have the Holy Spirit. And again, we are not to think of a kind of partial sharing, like being exposed to the work of the Holy Spirit to a degree or another. For the word that is used here denotes full participation. And again, in 2.14, it is used, and there it is used of Jesus sharing in our humanity. And again, clearly Jesus, if we are <laughs> biblical Christians, Jesus fully and not just partially shares in our humanity. He took on full humanity. And Paul writes in Romans 8, 9, that if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to, to Christ. So for the writer to say that they have shared in the Holy Spirit is the clearest marker He's talking about the Christians. Christians are partakers in God through the Holy Spirit. Unbelievers do not share in this gift. Fourthly, and fifthly, they, it's kind of two for the price of one, because one verb, again, we are going to taste, uh, but tasting two things. In verse five, we have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age. Again, this same word of being, uh, of tasting is used. And these are people who are not only hearers of the word of God, but they are receiving it as spiritual manna from heaven. There may be an allusion here to the manna uh, being given in, uh, in the book of Exodus. As God was speaking to them, they experienced the truth of Psalm 34, 8 to 10, which absolutely astonishing words, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. 
Fear the Lord, you his holy people. For those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Taste and see that the Lord is good. It's an experiencing the goodness of the word of God. So they were like the Thessalonians about whom Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. We also thank God continually because when you received the word, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God. Which indeed, which is indeed at work in you who believe. You see, the word of God accepted as the word of God, and then it is at work in you who believe. And in this way, by the working of the Spirit of God, through the word of God, they also foretasted what it will be like to be in God's presence, to be in glory. The powers of the coming age. In other words, as our writer says, and as and, and they as, as believers, again, to quote Paul from 2 Corinthians 3, 18, this time with unveiled faces, contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. They have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age. So suppose there is a, a person like that. And now comes the hard part, verse six, and who have fallen away. And then he falls away. He continues to describe the same person. This is a, this is a man who has denied the faith and in unbelief, turns away from the living God, as our writer was saying in 3.12. He is what we call an apostate. He is like the people about whom the Holy Spirit speaks in the quote we have already come across in chapter 3, verses 7 to 11, if you'd like to turn there. Today, as the Holy Spirit says, sorry, sorry, so as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness, where, uh, where your ancestors tasted, uh, tested sorry, and tried me through, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. I said their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared on earth in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. These people have partaken of all those blessings of God. But when they came to the border of the promised land, as they were so close to entering God's rest, their true colors came out. They were not the people who trusted God. They wanted to go back to their former way of life in Egypt. Could this happen? That someone genuinely tastes all the goodness of God, is saved, and then falls away. Well, the 1984 NIV does something here, which actually is quite helpful. They translate when um, we come to verse six, who have fallen away, which is the correct translation. That's what the, the Greek says. But they interpret it in the way it is meant. And the NIV 84 actually says, if they fall away. If they fall away. Which is expressing an important nuance in interpretation. This is a conditional scenario. And actually, it's a hypothetical one. Ultimately, this cannot happen. It's impossible for this to happen. We've just considered God's decree in the confession. It cannot happen. But what the holy, uh, and this is why actually I said, quite hopefully quite clearly, suppose there is a man. But the Holy Spirit, you see, is not in this passage trying to give comfort. 
Rather, he is confronting us. He is heeding, giving a warning. In particular, he is confronting those of us who are perhaps tempted to walk away from God as he reveals himself in the Bible. And the warning he issues is a very stern one. And the warning is actually, he begins in verse four, where he says, it is impossible. And then we've got this long description. And then in verse six, we are told what is impossible. And it is impossible for such a person, for an apostate, to be brought back to repentance. That is the warning. Why is it so? He gives two reasons here. First, from their perspective, from the apostate's perspective, they crucify Jesus all over again. In verse 6, this is how it continues. And who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance? To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. So they are crucifying Jesus all over again. And they are doing so to their loss, the writer says, incurring the wrath of God against people who reject and despise and publicly shame his son by their words and deeds. And in this way, they become guilty of the death of God's Messiah without becoming recipients of the forgiveness of sins through his death. For that sacrifice that Jesus offered was made for believers, not for unbelievers. And the apostate is an unbeliever. And further, we read that they are crucifying. Um, the, and this they are crucifying is a further characteristic of such people. By their falling away, by their apostasy, this is what they are doing. Their very life is a constant re-crucifixion of the Son of God. People who live like that, you see, do not seek repentance. What they seek is justification for their actions. And they will even twist the word of God if that's what it takes to support their position. An apostate is a very, very serious condition, an irreparable condition, according to the word of God. So that's from their perspective. They will not seek repentance. Their heart will be so hard they will not seek the living God. But from God's perspective, we come to verses 7 and 8. And we are told here that land that drinks, drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed, receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burnt. So this is talking about why it is impossible still uh, why it is impossible for the apostate to be renewed to repentance and now we are looking at it from god's perspective it is an agricultural example uh, to bring out the meaning of what he had been saying and first maybe also for a bit of a relief <laughs> he talks about the believer <laughs> you know the genuine believer that is and he compares that believer to a lamb that, upon receiving the rain God sends, does what? Produces a good crop. And, that the, bless and the blessing of the rain clearly represents the blessings that he has been describing in verses 4 and 5, or the blessings of God. And we are reminded, of course, also of the parable of the soils. Uh, sorry, the parable of the sower, the parable of the soils told by our Lord Jesus Christ, in which the genuine believer is characterized as being a good soil who produces a bountiful crop. That's how we know that he is a genuine believer. By their good works and their faithfulness to God, they show that they truly are believers, uh, genuine Christians. And in them, we are reminded of God's original good creation where that was what all the land did <laughs> um you know let the land produce vegetation 
And you can just imagine that uh, gloriously happening in Genesis chapter one. So the believer functions as a human being should function, like the good soil functions like all soils should function. That's salvation, that's restoration for our original God-given, God-ordained, God-designed purpose. It's wonderful, and it will be brought to completion on the day of Christ. But these are human beings who are genuinely saved, land that uh, drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and produces a crop useful to those for whom it is harm, uh, farmed, and it receives the blessing of God. But what happened once sin came into the world? The land was cursed. We read in Genesis 3, 17 to 18, a God addresses, uh, addresses Adam, and he says, because you listened to your wife and ate from the fruit about, uh, from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the what? The ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat from it all the days of your life. And what will it produce for you? It will produce thorns and thistles for you. And you will lead the plants of the field. And likewise, we have here the unbeliever characterized as land that produces thorns and thistles. And so here the apostate is characterized by this land that produces thorns and thistles. And what will happen with that land? And notice it's not the produce that comes under this, but it's the land. In the end, it will be burned. This is the language of God's judgment. It is impossible for the apostate to be renewed for repentance from his own perspective because he doesn't seek it. But from God's perspective, it is because he has placed him under his judgment. It is God and not man who grants repentance. And God does not grant repentance to the apostate, but rejects him. He treats him like an unbeliever, like he did with Pharaoh. God hands him over to the hardness of his heart. So it's a serious warning. And in passing, let me talk briefly about something that looks very similar to this. And in certain cases, maybe exactly looks the same way as apostasy, and that is backsliding. Now, that is when a genuine believer lives sinfully or holds to a false doctrine, perhaps even for an extended period of time. But there is a key difference between the apostate and the backslider. Um, but the difference is entirely internal. The apostate looks like a genuine believer, but is not. But the backslider is a genuine believer living in sin, but therefore can be renewed for repentance. But you can't tell them apart as a human being <laughs> because, well, we are human beings. Only God sees the heart. So what are we to do? And Jesus tells us what we are to do when Jesus teaches about how to deal with an unrepentant sinner. He teaches us that if after various attempts they remain unrepentant, the church should, and I quote Matthew 18, 17, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. In other words, treat him like a sinner who cannot remain in the fellowship of God's people. They are to be excommunicated. They live like a sinner. We can only go by fruit and we have clear instruction what to do. But what is the purpose of that, you see? It's twofold. On the one side, it serves the church for it protects the church fellowship. But, and we will see this in Hebrews later on, but, the second one is actually for the benefit of the person. And in this line, uh, our, our writer continues as well back in Hebrews chapter nine, chapter uh, six, I should say. And now we come to the pastoral purpose of this warning. And it is to wake his readers up because many of them were tempted to turn away from the living God. And he uses the strongest possible language to say to them, if you do that, there is no turning back. 
but he knows that warning those who truly belong to the Lord, who truly are like the person described in verses four and five, for them, that warning is going to be part of the blessing of the goodness of the word of God. It is a means of grace. So in other words, God's genuine believers will respond to the warning. God's genuine believe, uh, people respond the, to the warnings of God down through the, the scriptures. A turning to God is what characterizes someone who is genuinely uh, converted, belong to God, and are, and are convicted of, of some kind of, uh, of sin. There is a repentance when they are warned about that, a clinging to him who saves them. In other words, they respond in faith. Peter was restored uh, to the Lord after denying him three times. He was restored. He was a backslider. But the Lord graciously restored him after having warned him very seriously tonight. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. He did. He remembered. He broke down in tears. And he was restored. We will see that in John's gospel when, when we get to uh, that chapter. Peter was restored. And so are genuine believers who are tempted by the pull of the world and perhaps even taken steps to go back. They respond to the warning. And so we come to the encouragement. In verse 9, he says, even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case. And he says, the things that have to do with salvation. And so we come to the encouragement. And he starts talking about the ground for his confidence that they they will, they will uh, persevere in the faith and not fall away from the living God. And he talks to them about that. And here are two grounds for his confidence in verses 9 and 10. First of all, God loves them. God loves them. In verse 9, he calls them dear friends. I, I'm almost tempted to say, don't quote me on this, but I'm almost tempted to say, do quote me on this. I think this is the only place in Hebrew where he does this. He calls them dear friends. Now, it's actually the word beloved. And I don't think he is assuring them of his love for them. I mean, that, that would be nice. <laughs> but they need more than that. They need reassurance that they are loved by God. And I think this is what he does when he calls them beloved god loves them and so he's not referring here to the general love uh, that god has for all creation it's much more likely to be a reference to that special faithful covenant keeping love that god has for his people that he will hold me fast kind of love that we sang about in our first hymn he says god loves you and my ultimate hope as a believer and i hope i don't speak, uh, you know, just for myself here, of persevering as a Christian to the end is that God loves me. I echo wholeheartedly the answer to the first question in the Heidelberg Catechism, which the question is, what is thy only comfort in life and death? And listen to this glorious answer. Can you do the same, my friend? Can you, can you also say this? What is my Thy only comfort in life and death? And the answer is this, that I with body and soul, both in life and death, and not my, am not my own, but belong unto my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood has fully satisfied for all my sins and has deliv and delivered me from all the power of the devil and so preserves me that without the will of my heavenly father, not a hair can fall from my head. Yea, that all things must be subservient to my salvation. And therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life. And makes me sincerely willing and ready henceforth to live unto him. 
This is my only hope. For my love often is cold for him. And if I was left even partially to my own devices, I would be an apostate in no time. And so would all who call upon the name of the Lord. Had he not keep us and loved us, we would all fall away. Blessed be the Lord. That is not how salvation works. God loves them. Beloved, he says to them. Dear friends, almost doesn't do it justice. Beloved would be better. So I'm going to say beloved. So he assures them of God's love for them. But also he says, look at yourselves at the same time. Which is a weird thing to say oftentimes to a believer. Look at yourself. Oftentimes we want to look away from us. And that's true. But sometimes we need to look at our lives. And he says, look at yourselves. And he reminds them of their love for God. That's the second ground. He says in verse 10, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. They love God. And he says, he will not forget your work and the love you have shown him. They love God. And he knows that they love God. Why? Because their love is not just talk. It's work. <laughs> they show that they love God by um, uh, helping God's people and continuing to help them. This is not them working to be saved, trying to bribe God or pay their way into heaven. <laughs> it springs. All they do springs from the love you have shown him. That is why they love his people. As you have helped his people and continue to help them. These recall Jesus' words. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of sis and sisters of mine, you did it for me. And he's saying, look at, look at yourselves. Look how long you've stuck together, helped one another, we will see uh, that, you know, some of them have suffered material loss for the sake of Christ and they've helped each other. And said, Look at it. Look at all this that you are doing. This is evidence in God is at work in you. So as far as you are concerned, we are convinced of the things that are for salvation. Jesus also said, whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Believers, loving believers, show that they love God, which is what they are doing. And God is not unjust, he says. He will not repay their love for him by repudiating them. I mean, that would, we wouldn't do that as a, well, actually, we would do that as a human being sometimes, but God wouldn't. It's unthinkable. God is just. And so he says, God loves you. And we know you love God by the way you live. And so he is convinced of better things and he is encourages them. And so then he goes on to encourage them to keep on keeping on, as the British phrase says, keep on keeping on. You know, not exactly keep calm and carry on. It's hard to keep calm when you are being persecuted, but keep on keeping on. Here we have a couple of encouragements in verses 11 and 12, expressing the writer's desire for his readers. A good pastor wants what is best for his flock because the great good shepherd desires the same. And so here are two desires that he has for them. First of all, he desires them to persevere to the end. He says, we want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for may be fully realized. We do not want you to become lazy. And that's how he began in 5.11 but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Follow the Lord through thick and thin. Follow him to the Father all the way to the end, he says to them. Now, there is an unhelpful expression that you can sometimes hear, and probably I've used it as well. Uh, and it sounds like this, once saved, always saved. Now, of course, there is an element of truth in that. But what it communicates is not true. You see, the Bible gives no grounds for assurance of salvation for a person who once made this decision to follow Christ, but now lives as an unbeliever. 
This is precisely the pastoral burden of Hebrews. No, Jesus' teaching is rather this, the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Matthew 24, 13. And similarly, look how the writer of Hebrews charges his readers in verse 12 to imitate those who, through faith and patience, inherit what has been promised. And we'll have a whole chapter of them in chapter 11. Those who have run the race, they have pressed on, and they did not turn back, and they are now in heaven, as it were, cheering you on. Come on! This is great! Come here where we are! Do not turn away from the living God. I'm paraphrasing Hebrews 11. Jesus' people don't fall into heaven, you see. They follow their master there. Run the race. So he desires for this perseverance for them. And secondly, he wants them to have assurance now. The one who perseveres, you see, also gains something precious in this life. Assurance of salvation. The phrase in verse 11, what you hope for may be fully realized, can equally be translated as the 1984 NIV does, in order to make your hope sure. Or to have the full assurance of hope, I think the ESV says. And if we translated it so, then the focus falls not on the end, but on the journey itself. One of the ways a believer can find encouragement that God's love and not his wrath rests on them is that they walk in faithfulness and obedience with God. This is the teaching of 1 John um, 5, you know, 1, 5 to 7, for instance, where we read, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. He is saying, look at yourself. What do you see? Do you walk in the light? If you walk in the light, then we have fellowship with God and fellowship with one another as brothers and sisters. So be encouraged. You are in the right. Don't give up. Keep on walking in the light. And the context actually of 1 John in this regard is quite similar to that of Hebrews. But maybe you say, yes, I do see that. Calix, I do see that. I do see that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, try, I'm, I'm seeking to walk in the light. But I also see sin. And it troubles me. And so it should. It should trouble us if we sin. But I tell you something, that also, that the fact that our sin troubles us, that also is good news. It's a sign of life. It's only dead people who don't react to stuff. Living people react to stuff. And the sign of spiritual light is that we do not want to sin. We love God. Why would we want to sin against him? And so actually John continues, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. You don't want to be those people who say they've arrived. You're looking at someone who at least doesn't know themselves. Maybe self-deceived. A believer is keenly aware of how, fall, uh, how short we fall. But if we confess our sin, John writes, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And walking in the light doesn't mean sinless perfection. It means walking in a way that reflects our Lord, even if that reflection is imperfect. It is precisely being troubled by the imperfection, which leads to repentance. <laughs> and that gives confidence that you are not an apostate. Because remember, an apostate does not seek repentance, but justification for their sinful actions. So, can you say with the Heidelberg Catechism? Let me finish by reminding us our, ourselves of it. And I pray that we can sincerely say this before the Lord. What is thy only comfort in life and death? That I, with body and soul, both in life and death, am not my own, but belong unto my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ who with his precious blood has fully satisfied for all my sins and delivered me from all the power of the devil and so preserves me that without the will of my heavenly father, not a hair can fall from my head, 
yea, that all things must be subservient to my salvation. And therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me sincerely willing and ready henceforth to live unto him. Have you that desire and that trust, my dear friend, today? If you have even a sliver of it, be encouraged. If not, now is the time to start thinking, where do you stand with the Lord? Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you that you speak to us and all that you say is good for us. We thank you that your purposes are good for your people. That warning and encouragement alike come from the mouth of a loving father for us who trust in Christ. Oh Lord, forgive us when we uh, sin. But we thank you for your work in our hearts that troubles, uh, that, that, that causes us to be troubled by our sin. Oh Lord, we have no confidence in ourselves. We could never keep our hold through life's fearful path. For our love is often cold. You must hold us fast. And we thank you that there is this encouragement at the end of this passage. Oh, Father, bind it to our hearts. We pray, Lord, for any who are uh, perhaps discouraged in their walk with you today. Father, please would you assure them of their love, uh, of your love for them. And would you point out your works of grace in their lives, that they will be encouraged. And Father, should there be anyone listening to this message, O oh Lord, who are not one of your children, Lord, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We pray that they would be brought to repentance today, that today, if they hear your voice, it will not harden their hearts, but respond in faith. So we thank you, Heavenly Father, for all that you say and all that you do for us. Amen. Amen. So we are going to uh, sing once more. And